Sony completely dominates the top 10 retail camera sales for the second half of November. We only have one Canon camera in the top 10, but we do have two new camera models making their debut. Which ones are they? Details coming up, but first, I encourage you to subscribe and choose all notifications so that way you can stay up to date on the latest camera gear, news, and rumors. Yodobashi is a major retailer in Japan selling everything from consumer electronics to, well, cameras, and they just reported their camera sales for the second half of November. And as I stated in the introduction, wow, do we have some surprises this week. Not only does Sony dominate with six cameras in the top 10, that's right, six cameras, we only have one Canon camera and we also have some new camera models. So you might be wondering, well then which camera, which Canon camera is showing up in the top 10? Well, it's not their most popular camera, the Canon EOS R5 or the R6 or even the R3. It's an APS-C censored camera and it's the Canon EOS R10 with a kit form, the 18 to 150 millimeter image stabilized STM. I think this is a solid camera. I really do like this camera. For somebody that doesn't want to fiddle around with log footage, that doesn't need 20 frames per second, that doesn't need a 45 megapixel sensor, I think this is a great starting camera. I think this is even a great mid-level camera. In terms of video, you can shoot 6K over sample 4K, which I wish I had back in the 70D. I think this is a really solid replacement for the 70D or even if you still have the 80D and even for the 90D because the 90D didn't have that same level of detail that the R10 has. 6K over sample 4K, up to 23 frames per second stills, and a 24 megapixel sensor. Well, not as much as the Canon EOS R5. It's still a lot more than you'll find in your average smartphone, somewhere between 8 and 12 megapixels. In ninth place, we have our first Sony camera. At $898, it's the Sony A6400, a very solid camera that's capable of doing 4K video up to 30 frames per second. It can also shoot 11 frames per second stills, and I think it's an all round good solid camera, just like the Canon EOS R10. And if you're in the market for the R10, you should also look at the Sony as well, the A6400. They're both really solid APS-C censored cameras, but a word of caution. Regardless of what you're looking at, what you really need to think about before purchasing any camera from any brand is ask yourself this very important question. What outcomes, what results are you looking for in a camera? And then once you do that, then ask yourself, well, okay, if these are the outcomes I'm looking for, do they provide enough, a deep enough inventory of lenses? Because that really matters. And don't just think about what you're looking for today, but ask yourself what you might want to grow into in the future. So really looking at the lens inventory of a camera maker, I would say is far more important than the bodies themselves. I'm surprised to announce that in eighth place, we have the Sony FX3. And the reason why I'm surprised to announce the FX3 in this place is because, well, the FX30 recently came out. It's an APS-C censored camera with basically the same capabilities, the same outcomes as the Sony FX3. Now, the main difference between these two cameras is the sensor. The FX3 is a full frame camera and it's really based off of the Sony A7S III. So really the same resolutions, refresh rates, capabilities, but the one big difference is price. Less than half the price of the Sony FX3 at around $38.98, the FX30 can be had for $17.98. That's a huge difference in price. It's also got dual gain ISO. So it's a really, really solid camera. It's been selling well, but it's completely absent from the top 10. I'm, yes, I know there's seven, six, all the way up to first place, but I can tell you right now, we've got the FX3, but nowhere in the top 10, which is another surprise, do we have the FX30. In seventh place, we have the Fuji XS10. This camera sells for about $100 more than the A6400 at $999 without a lens. It also has a larger sensor with 26 megapixels and is backside illuminated. So again, another solid all round camera. It's got some more capabilities or more enhancements, slightly better low light performance. But again, you always wanna look at what kind of lenses it has and also what are the capabilities you're looking for. I get a lot of people asking me, yeah, this is a great camera, it's on sale. Do you think I should get this camera? And I can never really answer that question without following up with another question. But what capabilities are you looking for? What matters to you in terms of a camera? What matters for you more or less in terms of the outcomes? What are you trying to achieve? And if you're really confused and you're really trying to decide between two major cameras, I do offer consulting down below. So I've got some details. There's a link to verbling.com. If you want to get in touch with me, we can talk up to an hour or even more if you've got lots of questions. All right, so that covers off that place. And now for another Sony. The Sony E10, I think, is one of the best vlogging cameras that follows up for the ZV-E1. 
at $698 with the body alone, I think it offers really good value. Sony really understood the market for this camera. People that want to do a lot of vlogging, people that are just a single YouTube channel or just enjoy going around and shooting, traveling, whatever, the Sony ZV-E10 is a great value at $698. It's got a 24 megapixel sensor and it can shoot up to 4K 30 frames per second. It's a really good bargain. I, I think whether you chose either the ZV-1 or the ZV-E10, both are really solid cameras. And if you're thinking of starting out, and yes, my discussion, that point I brought out about lenses really does matter. But when it comes to a camera body that just knows how to focus on your subject, yourself, for example, but also knows how to expose, it can take into account going from the shade and into the sun and still doing a pretty good job of exposing. It's one of the best cameras out for that. That's one thing Sony really understands well. So the ZV-E10 is a solid camera. And if you're thinking about the ZV-E10, but also keep an eye out for the ZV-E1. In fifth place, we have the Sony a7 IV with a zoom kit package. And I absolutely love this camera. And uh, well, probably you do as well. You see, it's the top selling camera in 2022. It's normally in first or second place, but what's key here, if we add the sales figure for the Sony a7 IV with the kit package, it quite easily tops the charts almost year after year. Well, not year after year, almost month after month. The Sony a7 IV sells very, very well. And I know it does have a few caveats, but which camera doesn't? Yes, I know the rolling shutter is a little bit more extreme than other camera models in its price point. And yes, I know at around 10 frames per second, it's slow compared to, well, the Canon EOS R6 for the same price at $24.99, it can do 20 frames per second. But if you look at the video capabilities of this camera, the ability for it to pull focus, and yes, I know the Canon pulls focus well as well, but its ability to expose based on the autofocus point and giving you more exposure tools in video modes, I think this is a very compelling camera. At $24.99, Sony really understands their customer base and they understand how to, well, produce a camera that does really good in terms of video and stills. But of course, you've got to look at the lens inventory and Sony with their E-mount, well, it's a pretty popular mount because it's open. I've got a lot of, we've got a lot of third-party lens makers as well as Sony as well. So you've got from the really cheap lenses from around $100 all the way up to some more expensive cameras into the, well, <laughs> thousands of dollars. So in fifth place, the Sony a7 IV and uh, the a7 IV body alone, that's coming up. But in fourth place, we have the Nikon Z9. And this continues to sell very well so long as Nikon can get enough of these cameras out to the stores. You know, I'm going to be bold enough to say this, that when it comes to the best camera of 2022, I'd say it's a tie between the Canon EOS R5 and the Nikon Z9. And why wouldn't I say the Nikon Z9? Well, the price does put it up there higher. And when we're talking about cameras that are around $6,400 and $5,500, these are not what make money for the camera companies because, well, they don't sell a whole lot. The Canon EOS R5 sells very, very well. And while it's not in the top 10, the camera's been out for about two and a half years. And with talk about the Canon EOS R5 Mark II coming out, I think a few people are waiting on the sidelines to see what's coming up next. So I really do, I, I still gotta say in 2022, I think the two best cameras are the Nikon Z9 and the Canon R5, the R5 Mark I. In third place, we have a Fuji camera. Can you guess which one it is? Yeah, it's the X-T5. Some of you were really surprised that we didn't see this for the first half of November. Where's the X-T5? Why aren't we seeing it in the numbers? Where's the Canon EOS R6 Mark II? Why isn't it in the numbers? Well, the R6 Mark II didn't start shipping until, well, the last couple of days of November, whereas the X-T5 had a bit of a leap on that. So it's no surprise that the X-T5 is in the numbers. It's doing well. I think Fuji's got a lot of things right when it comes to their sensors. They produce really good cameras with a lot of good capabilities. The only thing that's been a bit of a limiting factor for me as a customer, as somebody who's an ordinary filmmaker and photographer, early on, some of the limitations was, well, the number of lenses and the number of lenses with image stabilization because when I was looking at Fuji, I was looking at the FX3. They didn't have the FX4 and they didn't have in-body image stabilization. So I found the inventory of lenses back then to be rather lacking. But as cameras now have image stabilization in the X-T4 and many others, Fuji's looking to be a much more appealing platform. So congratulations on making it to the number three spot. But in the number two spot, we have another Sony. No surprises here. Can you guess which one it is? It's the Sony a7 IV in body form a really good camera selling for $24.99 right alongside the Canon EOS R6. And one thing Sony has done right, they seem to just say the right things to consumers, have the right capabilities, the right marketing, 
And they've decided to open up their e-mount so that anybody who wants to can make lenses for the e-mount. And one thing that's left a bit of a bad taste in people's mouths is Canon's recent enforcement of their IP, basically saying that anybody who's going to produce RF lenses that has autofocus, well, they're going to come down. Canon's going to come down hard on them like a bag of wet hammers with their legal team. And that's really, well, it's got a lot of people upset. Some people just don't care. Other people are disappointed. But it's upset enough people, and based on the comments I've seen on my channel, people are saying, you know what, I'm going to go to the a7 IV, I'm going to go to the Sony a7 III, or some other camera like the FX3 or the FX30. Uh, myself, I don't really have these numbers. All I can do is report on the numbers we're seeing by Yodabashi, but camera and others, and I really hope someday that B&H starts releasing their numbers because they're a major U.S. retailer of camera and all things camera, both video and stills. And maybe I should reach out to my contacts and see if it's possible that we could somehow get those numbers released. Anyhow, it's time to move on to the number one spot. Can you imagine which camera debuts in the number one spot this week? I'll give you a hint. It's a new camera. It's a Sony. That's right. You've already guessed. Yeah, it's the Sony a7R5. This camera was announced not too long ago, back at the end of October, early November. The date actually eludes me right now. I think it was actually November the 1st or November the 2nd. And I was quite impressed with this camera. And yes, there are some limitations. And yes, there are some caveats. If you're shooting 8K video, for example, they don't do 30 frames per second and uh, some other things. But they've also done some rather, well, unique enhancements. Their pixel shift. Um, I used to think that, well, pixel shift was a gimmick, that it really didn't serve any purpose. Uh, if you had anything moving in the frame, and yes, generally that's leaves and grass. So unless you're shooting rocks or mountains uh, where there are no clouds, then, you know, pixel shift doesn't serve a point. And even if you're shooting on concrete, if you're shooting on granite, the ground moves. It moves enough that th those vibrations when you're doing pixel shift will actually translate through. And even when I'm shooting out, I'm shooting the moon or I'm shooting the stars, I have to be careful. I set things up, then I walk away from the tripod because even walking around the tripod on asphalt will cause, thing, cause try that again, caw, caw. It's like I've got a moth in my mouth, will cause things to vibrate. But Sony's new pixel shift technology in the Sony a7R5 is terrific. The reviews are out there. And even if you have people walking in the frame, if you have birds flying, whatever it is, I don't know what Sony's cooked into this camera, into the technology. But pixel shift is now what I consider a viable technology. And yes, you have to take the images out of the camera and you have to put them into their software for it to all work out. But still, we now have pixel shift doing 240 megapixels that you can actually use the images that you can zoom in and you get about twice as much detail. The detail is noticeable. So I think in first place, Sony has well deserved their top spot with the A7R5. But in a bit of a retrospective here, looking back over the top 10 and looking back over other Yodobashi top 10s of their retail camera sales, I'm really surprised not to see Sony dominate because I've seen Canon dominate too a couple of months ago. I think Canon had six cameras in the top 10, but the other four placements were Sony's and they weren't relegated to the bottom of the list. This month, this is a big surprise. We have six Sony cameras in the top 10 they dominate the top three positions. They dominate the full top 10. And we only have a single Canon camera. And it's their APS-C E10 in kit form in the number 10 spot. Now, over the last couple of weeks, as I put out videos talking about the Yodobashi top 10, many of you said, yes, but Simon, this third-party lens business, it hasn't had enough time to seep through. And I think what was happening, too, is we were having people waiting for a refresh of the Sony a7 III, the A9 Mark III, and several other Sony cameras. All the rumors were pointing towards, well, September, October, and we finally had an announcement. So the pent-up demand for the Sony a7R5 over the R4, and maybe even those that were looking at the a7 IV decided that, wow, this new camera, the Sony a7R5 looks good, and some Canon owners I know have switched over to Sony. I really do wonder how much of an impact this decision by Canon to, let, let's be honest here, they're enforcing their patent laws. We live in a capitalist society. We live in a market, free market economy. And whether you like that or not, Canon's within the right to do what they did. But I think for those that are really upset and angry, and maybe you're one of them, it's because they've taken away, in a way, some of our dreams. If you look at those Sigma lenses, the 150 to 600 millimeter, the 14 to 24, the 70 to 200, 
if you bought into the R system knowing that Sigma wasn't going to be too far behind with some of those lenses, I can understand being more than disappointed and frustrated. I can understand being upset. And I don't think that we're going to have to wait too much longer before we start to see Sigma and Tamron lenses and other lenses with autofocus for the RF system. It might not be 2024. It might be late in 2023, but I do believe it's going to happen. The only question I wonder is how much pressure are you, the viewer, putting on Canon, getting them to notice and say, look, we're, we're really not too happy about this. We love your cameras. I was looking at buying camera X, but with this decision, I can't afford lens X. Where are the affordable lenses? Bring Sa Samron, bring Tamron and Sigma, allow production of these lenses. And that's what I would do. I mean, the other option you have, as some of you are doing, is switching over to Sony or Fuji. Just a comment earlier this morning, somebody bought a Fuji. I can't remember if, the, if it was the X-T5 or not, but you can vote with your dollars. And if you don't want to lose all your lenses and migrate over, and again, you can take your Canon lenses and adapt them over the Sony E-mount. But the other thing you can do is reach out to Canon, let them know you're disappointed. We saw this with 24 megapixels being removed. There was so much upset, so much revolt against Canon that Canon very quickly brought it back over the next six months, starting with some cameras just a month or two after making that decision. So I, I think this is definitely playing as a factor. I just don't have any data to indicate to what degree it's playing. And again, this is just a two week period. I'd really like to see what happens as we move into December and see those numbers. And I'm also curious to see what, well, the, how CEPA is reporting the worldwide camera sales uh, as a marketplace. Is it growing? And I think it will grow into December instead of, well, shrinking like we did in 2020. We had a big boost from the Canon R5, the R6, and the Sony A7S III. And then in November and December, that kind of sank down a bit. And we didn't get, we didn't, things didn't pick up until mid-year the following year. So what do you think when it comes to what Canon's done with the third-party lenses? What I'd really like to know is your opinion on how much you think this is affecting sales today and into the future. And also let me know, if you've let me know in the past, let me know again. Have you decided to purchase a Sony, a Fuji, or a Nikon instead of Canon over their policy with third-party lenses? Let me know in the comments section down below. But now I want to talk about something very, very important. We've seen a lot of cameras in the top 10, and what this quite often does is it gets me, and maybe even you thinking, hey, maybe I should get camera X. Now, Sony's dominating, and Sony makes a lot of good cameras. They're in second place in terms of worldwide sales at 27%. Canon with 46.8%, or right around there, and of course, Nikon with 11.3%. They're the top three, and together, they make up, well, the vast majority of cameras sold to the world, in 2022 and going all the way back to, well, 2015, 2016. What's really important when you're trying to decide on a camera is not looking at the specifications. That's the worst thing you can do. You do that and you risk buyer's remorse. The thing that's most important is try to think of what outcomes am I trying to achieve? Am I primarily a photographer or videographer? And as a photographer or videographer or both, what do I want to capture? What do I want my video to look like? What do I want my photos to look back? Describe them and come up with capabilities or outcomes with no more than two or three words. Here's an example of something that I created here myself. And it's a very, very simple chart. I was doing this for a previous video. I've got three cameras here, all the same capabilities, things such as accurate and reliable autofocus, lens selection, image quality, dynamic range, these are just some samples. And of course, I've got video outcomes down below with some scenarios in the middle. And then color code, use three colors or five, no more than five, and then color code them in terms of, well, which camera performs very well in this capability and which camera performs poorly. And then maybe what you wanna do as you've done that, then go over and circle the ones where there are capabilities that are an absolute must. So for example, for you, if an autofocus system that's highly reliable and accurate, matters? Well, circle that in black or some other color to let you know that, yeah, this has to be very good. It has to be at least green for me to consider this camera. And then what I, what I highly recommend you doing is the camera that you were thinking of getting, put that in the number one spot, but then take cameras that were competing against that, or maybe a camera that's higher up or even lower than that, and do no more than three side by side. Try to narrow it down to three when you do this. And what you're going to end up with is a beautiful color-coded diagram, and the one with the most green, and the one where the mandatory capabilities are, well, covered off in green the most, 
well, that should be the camera that should be in your, your top decision, this one or another one. And that's what I did when I ended up buying the Canon EOS R5 several years ago. Despite it being priced well out of my budget, it delivered all the capabilities I was looking for. Sharp detail, 4K video. It provided 4K video up to 120 frames per second. Great dynamic range, good low light performance. And in terms of a stills camera, it had really good capabilities, high resolution. And I'm not trying to sell a Canon EOS R5 camera on you or the R5, the R6, or the EOS R. But if you use this model, I guarantee you, you're not going to walk away with buyer's remorse. Just be honest with yourself. Don't worry about third-party lens makers or decisions that camera companies are doing. Try not to shoot yourself in the foot by thinking of how Sony might have done something to you in the past or how you're unhappy with Nikon in the present. Just look at the cameras for their capabilities. And part of the building out these capabilities is not just looking at the cameras, but the lenses and the lens inventory. And again, flashing this image up. The second capability I mentioned is lens selection. You might even have more capabilities than just lens selection, but for me at the time, that was sufficient. So this is a way to sort of capture the outcomes you're looking for that you want in an ecosystem, camera ecosystem. And I think it's gonna help you, well, certainly come up with a better decision, and it might even surprise you as well. But that's all I have for you today. I hope you have yourself a great weekend, but I do ask one favor of you. If you could please go ahead and subscribe and choose all notifications. It really helps this channel out. And if you're thinking of purchasing any of the cameras here in the top 10, please use my links down below to amazon.com or BNH because it doesn't cost you anything at all. And it comes back to me anywhere from 2% to 4% in terms of commissions that I can use to purchasing more equipment for improving this channel. But that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and choose all notifications. But that's it for now. Have yourself a great weekend and we'll see you again soon.